My name's Phil Winder, I'm a, a freelance engineer, and I'd just like to have a quick shout out to Container Solutions and Weaveworks who have, have funded this talk, so thank you very much to them. So this is a presentation called Secure My Socks, and we're going to explore micro microservice security in a, an open source sock shop. So the first thing I always want to do whenever I write presentation is do a quick Google to make sure nobody else has called the presentation the same sort of thing, and I typed, you know, secure my socks into Google, and, and this came up, something called socklocks.com, and I would never have thought that there was ever a need for a plastic clip to hold your socks together, but apparently there is. Um, I particularly love some of the use cases at the bottom. We've got a perfect for keeping similar color, but not exactly matching socks separate. So, I don't know, maybe there's a, a use case for everything. Um, and of course, as soon as I saw that, I immediately thought of this. <laughs> Sir, if I may make so bold, a major crisis has arisen in your affairs. Yes, I know, Blackheader. I've been pondering it all morning. You have, sir? Yes. Socks. Run out again. <laughs> Why is it that no matter how many millions of pairs of socks I buy, I never seem to have any? Sir, with your forgiveness, there is another, even weightier problem. They just disappear. <laughs> Honestly, you'd think someone was coming in here, stealing the damn things, and then selling them off. <laughs> <laughs> that was Blackadder, if you uh, never come across it before. Uh, that was purely for my own enjoyment, so sorry about that. Um, context. Uh, start being serious, if I, if I, if I can. Um, so we'll start off with a, a quick show of hands. Who has to deal with uh, PCI compliance, either, either now or in the past, or your equivalent? Oh, okay, not as many as I expected. Um, so for those that don't know, it's uh, payment card industry uh, compliance standards, which is a set of policies set out to protect users' card detail. Um, some tactics that developers can employ in order to become PCI compliant kind of comes down to one key question. It's do you or do you not trust the developer or, or the people that are working within the application? If we assume trust, then that takes a, a significant amount of responsibility off the developer. So it makes the developer's job much easier. Um, this means that the developer doesn't have to design and encode information um, about trust within, to their, within their application. But in order to become PCI compliant, then you have to audit like mad in order to prove that you are compliant. So this is generally what large enterprises do. Um, we know that, that, that Google does this. Um, and they have large teams that are constantly going around auditing, basically monitoring logs to make sure that, that people don't go where they're not supposed to go. And if, if they do go, then you know that's bye-bye to their parking space in, in Silicon Valley. Um, but what about everyone else? So we've, we've got from like individual developers, like you and me, up to small to medium-sized companies. You know, they don't have the time or the resource in order to do this constant audit. So you know, how do we achieve that? Top tip number one, we limit the surface area. And I heard it mentioned a few times today. The smaller amount, uh, the, the smaller the, the size of the surface, the, the less we have to worry about protecting. If you've got lots of tiny exposed interfaces, then that becomes inherently more difficult to, to audit and therefore secure um, than one very small, simple interface. And one of the simplest ways to do that is to offload as much of that requirement, um, offload it to, to somebody else, like a payment provider. So, um, for example, I've just finished a project where we used a, you know, just a semi-standard payment provider, and we embedded their payment details iframe into our front-end UI. So, um, if we ever had to uh, get a PCI audit performed on us, then, we, well, th we wouldn't, because none of the credit card information ever touches either our client-side code or the, the back-end either. It just goes straight to the payment provider. Um, but ultimately, you kind of have to throw off the shackles of assumed trust and just trust nothing and trust nobody. And then you can start implementing things which are inherently secure, which we're going to talk about today. And we'll discuss uh, a couple of ways that we can start to try and limit this surface area through um, network segmentation and policy, which we're talking about later. But let's be clear about one thing. PCI compliance does not mean your application is secure. It's merely a bureaucratic process 
to you know try and uh, and give give the users trust that that their details are safe. It does not cover any other form of your application's function or any other type of data as well. And I'm going to try and insert a few funnies to, to keep everybody livened at this late hour. And this is the first one I got sent this a uh, couple of days ago by my colleague. And it was uh, a little post that somebody had put on Reddit um, asking, why is Docker swearing at me? Now, before anyone says this is fake, could be fake, but I still find it funny. Apparently, some chap who is just trying to log into Docker Hub to push a Docker image, just like you would every day, um, he got an error response back from the, the Docker Hub service. And it, it said, incorrect password, blurry line. I can't say that on, the, on, on speaker. And apparently, he didn't type that in. So, so I don't understand what's happened there. That means somebody has either left this in accidentally or... Maybe they've just been fired and they decided to, to leave some sort of Easter egg bomb in their code that every now and again it'll just swear at you randomly. I don't know. But this is coming from a company which is, you know, the, they're trying to position themselves as the microservice company. And it's even difficult for them to get everything perfectly, which, you know, just comes to the, the obvious point. Security is hard. And it's not that it's complex, like academically complex. Um, since there's many things that we can do which are, are very simple. But it's, the problem is, it's like, it's like I was talking to someone earlier today where they said, you know, I'm not a security expert. No, no, nobody talking about security ever says they're an expert because it's, it's inherently difficult to say that you are secure or you are hack-proof because you're only those things until you're not. Um, so, I don't know. In, in the beginning, I like to, to, to start off like um, a, a traditional software development process where... Uh, we start exploring all the things that could go wrong, a failure exploration. exploration. Um, and that can include things pertaining to containers and containerized solutions. Um, there's tens, probably, of individual topics that could probably make a talk each. And uh, we're not going to talk about all of them because we don't have enough time. So today I'm going to concentrate on content security, which is taking... But unfortunately, my talk was scheduled after Adrian's talk earlier on. So I was going to say that he's copied me, but now it looks like I've copied him. But, you know, who cares? Um, and a bit about container security and a bit about ne network segmentation and policy. Um, and to do this, we're going to abuse one of our recent projects, which is the Sock Shop. The Sock Shop is a reference microservices architecture. And as a developer, I kind of work better by having examples to learn from and to, to copy and paste and hack. And a lot of the talks that we've, you know, the very, very good talks um, that we've seen today, yesterday, and, and other conferences, but often they don't have anything to take away from. So what I'm hoping for is I'm going to talk about all this, then you can go home, go onto this repo, and try it yourself. So that's the idea. So this is it. Let's take a quick look. Let's hope this works. And it's somewhere here. There it is. Awesome. Yep, great. This is it. So this is our application. And it is a, uh, an implementation of an e-commerce site, um, which has you know, all the functionality of a real fun uh, e-commerce site, but it's all based in microservices. And it's all on GitHub, so you can explore it. The idea is that we're selling socks. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there's one particular sock that I'm a real fan of. There we go, nerd leg. That's one of my favorites. For those leg lovers out there, a perfect example of swivel chair trained calf, meticulously trained on a diet of sitting and pina coladas. Four. And that's my favorite sock. So I'm going to add that to my car. I'm going to log in. Uh, you're not going to laugh when I type password as password. Okay, there we go. And we're going to check that out. So it's got like a, an end-to-end -end kind of life cycle of something that might happen in a, a, might, might happen in a real life e-commerce site. And the idea is we're kind of exercising all the different stages and life cycles within the microservices context. Um, and it's all open source on GitHub. And I will pull up the link to that in a minute because we've got a nice short on git.io. Um, but I just want to point something out before we go on. So microservices demo site is split up into 
several uh, services which are all done independently. But the landing page is this microservices depo, demo repo. And then in the deploy folder, we've got a range of different deploys that you can deploy to. I don't know if you can see that, just about. Um, I'm going to be showing uh, the Docker Compose and the Kubernetes deploys today. But there's also loads of other deploys for um, lots of other orchestrators and well, as well. And that's, that's where this gets really cool, because it means you can take the same application and test out different orchestrators with basically the same thing. So I think this is going to be really handy for people that, that need to explore different orchestrators or just need some experience with them. OK, let's go back to the presentation. OK, so the link to that, I'll put it up again at the end, git.io slash sockshop is the shortened URL. But the, the real GitHub URL is, is microservices demo. OK, so let's crack on to the meat of this presentation. Once I've found my page again, there we go. So yeah, so Adrian talked about um, container security earlier on. He did a you know, great job of covering pretty much all the aspects that you need to know about container security. Um, and I'm going to try and put some of those things um, in an example so you can kind of see what happens. Um, Click it's not working. So I kind of classified the container level security aspects into these four. Um, so restraint is what Adrian was talking about earlier, where you're defining what the, the person can do within the container. You have to try and restrain that down as much as possible. So we're, we're talking about um, making sure that the container runs as a user making sure that it's read-only, making sure that it's uh, not got all of the permissions um, to, do, to, do to do everything. And then we've got immutability. We're also going to talk about that. And if you make your container immutable, then there's less risk of them accessing your data and messing around with your data. We've got provenance, which is where the container come from, and <coughs> the hardened OSs, modules, and policies. And that's uh, a whole other subject on its own. So, yeah, a lot of people have already done a quite a lot of talking about this, but I'm going to show you how to do this. So, we're going to start with one of the Docker files from the microservices demo repository. And I've chosen one which is mine, so I don't upset anybody else when I say it's a shit Docker file. It's a shit Docker file, it's my fault, not anybody else's fault. <laughs> Um, it's a typical Docker file that you might find anywhere. It's based on Alpine Node. It's a Node-based, Node.js based application. It's a front end. Um, we're copying some source files in, doing an install, and uh, exposing some ports and, and running it. Very, very standard. We've also got a, an extract from the Docker Compose file here for the front end image. Um, you can see a crazy hash there of the, the image, the, the, the name of the, the build at that time, a couple of host name, environment networks. So, yeah, very standard stuff. So, the first thing you might have noticed is I didn't set a container user. No user in that file. So, let's kind of have a quick look to see what we can do when you don't put a real uh, user in. And yeah, Adrian demoed this as well, but I think my demo is even better. So what I've got here is a Docker Compose file, um, which is running. And it's got all of the services running. And I'm going to exec into the front end. So let's just check who I am. Oh dear, root. So we can do things like this in our container. We can run a Bitcoin miner, like we were talking about before. Or you could have a train go across your screen, which I personally prefer. Much better. Um, another, so let's go back to that. OK. So yeah, no user. You might have also noticed that in the Docker Compose file that I didn't make it read-only. Um, potential boo-boo there. So let's take some code and, uh, oops, go back a step, and do that in the same container. OK, so I think that ran. Oh, it did, two lines. Let's go back to our, ah, 
same again. Because the container is not immutable, we can write whatever we want. That wasn't me. It was somebody else that hacked that, honestly. And finally, capabilities. So um, this is probably the, the slightly, more, slightly more tricky part of um, securing the Docker file. Um, it's a kernel level operation permissions. And the difficulty is that you never quite know where to apply them. So sometimes they apply in the container itself, sometimes they apply in the Docker file. And depending on what you're trying to do, they go in different places. Um, so let's take an example. So this is another Docker file, very simple one, from the catalog uh, service. It's using BusyBox. Um, we're using a statically compiled Go binary, and we're running it in port 80. So being good engineers, the first, we want to, first thing we want to do is to add a user to make it not run as root. And so we do something like this. Add group, add user, my user. But if we tried that, that wouldn't work. And it wouldn't work because all ports under 1024 are privileged, which means that only root can actually bind to those ports. Because we're running as my user, my user doesn't have the permission to bind to port 80. So that service would actually fail. So what do we do here? Well, one solution is to give that container, uh, to give that application the permission in order to bind to port 80. So I've switched to Alpine now, just to give me the nice package manager rather than BusyBox. And um, I'm still using the, the same ad group and ad user, but I'm also adding a package called libcap. And libcap is a, a set of libraries which is um, called the same thing in most OSs. In Alpine, it's called libcap. And it, uh, it provides a couple of binaries, one of which is setcap. Setcap applies permissions to individual files. So when we run that particular file, it will run with that particular privilege. And in this, this instance, we're adding the permission to bind the service to a particular port. So now, when we run that, it'll work. There's also um, set sh, set sh. Uh, that's a, another similar file, which is like a, a permissions-enabled um, shell-like construct. So you can run, you can run uh, applications with permissions, as opposed to setting those permissions on the file. Um, OK. And then we move on to the, the other level, the, the, the orchestrator part of the application. And we've got this cap drop and cap add commands. And cap drop is, does, yeah, it does what it says. Cap drop, drop the privileges in this list. And cap add, add the privileges in this list. For, um, for, the, for the drop, there's a, a keyword called all, which makes it drop all the commands. And then we add back in the, only the ones that we, we, we need to run, our, uh, to run our service. So we've got the uh, read only true in there as well to make sure that the, the file is read-only. So that's um, Docker Compose specific syntax, but we can also look at Kubernetes, which is kind of, it's kind of similar, but just a different syntax. Um, we've got a specification container. This thing called a security context, which lives underneath the container. Um, same sort of thing here. Capabilities drop and add, and we're doing the same all in that particular uh, permission we're giving there. Um, slightly different name for the read-only option. This is probably more explicit, which is probably a bit nicer. Um, and Kubernetes also has this really neat little feature here where we can ask Kubernetes to verify that the container that starts really does run as non-root. And if it doesn't, if it does start, or try to start a root, it, it will fail. So it's a nice, nice little addition by Kubernetes there. OK, so let's try that again. So I'm going to take that Docker file uh, and that Docker Compose file. Oops, and I'm going to apply that again. So previously we were using a, an insecure version of the repo. Now I'm using a secure. And uh, when we exec back into the front end and try some of these commands, they don't work. So what, are, what have we got? 
Uh, that just here. I don't know if you should just be able to see that. So we've tried to install the application. Same permission denied. Permission denied. It's purely because we're not root anymore. Um, we're trying to write to a file, and we can't because it's read-only file system. We can also uh, actually look at the some of the um, capabilities that are, have have been inserted into the into the kernel that's running, and um, the, the the capabilities are represented by bits in uh, in all of these settings here. Um, when there's zeros everywhere, it means there's no capabilities. When there's you know letters and numbers, it means there is capabilities. So no capabilities at all. And finally, the who am I is reporting me as my user. Fantastic. So we can't get hacked anymore, which is good. OK, so let's go back to this view. So just to recap, set a user, dead easy to do. Make it read-only, also dead easy to do. And you, uh, use capabilities. You know, have this principle of least privilege and remove all, pr all uh, capabilities that you can. And generally, the procedure is to remove everything, and then it doesn't work, and then gradually start to re-add capabilities back to the application until your application is functional again. It's kind of a manual step at the moment. Um, there are a couple of tools out there that kind of help you with that, but I still found it easiest just to do that manually because I, I knew the, uh, the, uh, the application. So let's lighten the mood a little bit. Did you know that over in 2003, over 11,000 people were hospitalized because of socks. Five to 10 people die each year in the UK due to socks. So maybe we do need those sock locks after all, because I didn't realize that socks are that dangerous. Um, network segmentation and policy. Oh, it makes me laugh. You don't have to laugh, that's fine, I'll laugh. Um, network segmentation and policy. So this is a, a high level schematic of the, uh, the um, the microservices demo application. The circles represent services, and the, some of the services are backed by databases. And the, the links between them kind of roughly show the information flow, how they, how they uh, communicate with each other. So let's imagine a case where someone was able to, or to try and uh, access a service from an external source. How would we normally prevent it, do you think? Anyone? I'm gonna have a drink while we have a think. A firewall, thank you. <laughs> you nearly said it. You're almost right. You don't quite use a firewall. You use a Trump firewall, which is bigger and better and more badass than most other firewalls. So once you've got your Trump firewall in place. <laughs> yes, it is, it is as well. Look, there you go. That was totally accidental, but well, well spotted. Um, once you've got the, the, the firewall in place, then you, you, you're creating this, this, this zone within your application where you assume it's a bit safer than it was on the outside. And that's fine. You know, we, we can't live without firewalls. But it doesn't tend to prevent any miscommunications between the apps. So either if you imagine somebody already had access to the front end when they shouldn't have, they can easily uh, access some back end service because of the shared network. Um, I mean, that I mean that definitely could happen, and that's probably the worst case scenario. I would say the, the more common scenario is actually just part of application design. So you've drawn and, and you've created this architecture for a particular reason. There's no reason why that front end can't you know, totally ignore your recommendations for the architecture and just go to the shipping service directly. So there's also like an, uh, an application level component that's important within the same context. And what we can do to fix that is apply network segmentation. And the short story is that it's basically creating smaller sub-networks within your one name, uh, main network. So you could do this physically with different networks, you know, manual, physically different networks. Um, but generally, it's easier and more reliable to use a software-defined network. And this represents some of the networks that are in use for the uh, for the sock shop. So we've got an external, an internal, and a back office. Um, we set those uh, those networks in uh, the Docker Compose file here under the Networks tab for that particular service, and that's great. So we're saying that the shipping service belongs to the back office network. So only only uh, 
only other services which have the back office network and then access it. Um, but, you know, it's still kind of quite broad. Um, what we can do is we can try and access within the same network. So, you know, catalog can still access the cart. So the logic flow states from the diagram that the cart should be only communicating with the front end and the catalog should only be communicating with the front end. And I think the easiest way to show this is to actually, is actually to try it. So what I have is a cluster on AWS running the Kubernetes deploy. And um, hopefully we're still connected. We are. It's probably too small for you. And you can see all the pods, the different Kubernetes pods running there. So what we can do is we, oh, let me just copy that because that's quite a long one. So we can find the pod that we're interested in, which is the catalog pod, pod. And then we can, again, exec into that particular container. Uh, let's just make sure I've got the right one. So yes, we're in the catalog. Okay, so now what we should be able to do um, is telnet any particular car. I know the API, uh, so I can do that. Uh, okay. Okay, and you can see that the catalog has completely full access to the cart, and we can, you know, potentially obtain um, secure information that shouldn't really be available to this service. In this case, we're retrieving somebody's cart uh, for the user one, two, three, four. So. Yeah, that's not good. And the reason for that is because we're still on the same network. There's no problems with those two guys communicating. So this, again, is much like the firewall. It's still too, uh, it's, it, the scope is too wide. We need something that's much more fine-grained. We need something that's specific to specific services, and um, we need a way to describe which services can uh, talk to other services. And the solution is a network policy. And a network policy is a bit like a bouncer that doesn't let you in just because you're wearing shorts. Now, that does happen in the UK, believe it or not. If you're wearing shorts, sometimes don't let you in. I've been, yeah, accustomed to that. Um, and all it is, basically, is just a list of things that can communicate with other things. So we've got the front end is allowed to communicate with the user. The order service is allowed to communicate with shipping. But there's no policy between the catalog and the cart, so it totally denies all traffic between those two. Let's take a look at an example network policy. So we've got here the network policy set up for Kubernetes, and um, it's a little bit verbose, but it's quite simple. It's basically you're saying uh, uh, which container, so which container label can talk to which other container label on a specific port. And then these filters and uh, labels on the side here are basically just filtering for a particular pod or a particular container. And there's different filters you can use to get groups of things if you, if you so wish. So, yeah, okay, let's try that again. I'm now going to apply. Uh, so I've got to create the policy first. Okay, and then I've got to apply it. Okay, and then we're just going to exec back in again, and we're going to do the same thing that I did last time. Uh, yeah, that's right. And there you go. So it doesn't do anything. So what it's doing now is actually it's just constantly retrying, and eventually you'll just get a retry timeout. And that's because there's no um, there's no pathway between the catalog service and the cart service defined in that network policy. So the only thing that can access the carts is that front end. So, top tip number three. So you need a software-defined network to do this. Um, so this is using Kubernetes with the CNI plugin with WeaveNet. So WeaveNet is a, a software-defined network. There are other software-defined networks that also s support this. 
um, the CNI plugin enables these external software-defined networks to, to work with Kubernetes and, and the pods. Um, but yeah, it, this is kind of reliant on the software-defined network, but it really does help because that policy is, it becomes so much more focused um, on the individual services. You can specify those in advance, and if people, it's, there's a security aspect that is, is obvious, but there's also um, you know, the application-specific thing as well, where if you have this constraint explicitly stated, then there can be no accidents. You know, you can't have people accidentally communicating with services that they shouldn't be. You can't have processes hacked in, as it were, without you know, explicitly defining that those hacks are, are what you want. So definitely worthwhile. So let's start wrapping up. Um, so we've got the container stuff at the top and the network stuff at the bottom. We talked about setting up a user. And we do so so that we can't run commands as root, dead simple. We make it immutable so people can't mess around with the files if they do get inside the application. We, we add restraint to the application by setting the capabilities that are allowed and not allowed. And then we talked about networks. We're using a, a great big Trump firewall to block everything from the outside. We're using network segmentation, which is like the, the middle ground between policy and firewall. Um, separates individual groups of services into a network. And then we've got the network policy, which I think is the, really, is the coolest bit um, about the, this, this whole thing. Um, and finally is the sock shop. So there's the link again. Go and take a look. You can go and try this right now if you've got your laptops open. Um, what you can do there is take the, these services, whether they're secure or insecure, and you can mess around with them and put them on an orchestrator of your choice. Um, what we're really looking for is to keep that project moving. And we can do that by asking for help from people, um, ways in which you can help. One, one cool idea is sometimes when we uh, are, are trying to test some new hires, then what we will do is ask them to do a PR to an open source repo. Um, this is a, a perfect example of kind of a low risk, it doesn't really matter, submit a PR, and if it's good, it'll get accepted kind of project because nobody's really depending on it. Um, so I think that's one good thing you can maybe take away and implement in your policies is to ask people to submit to Weaveworks, uh, sorry, to, um, to Sockshaw, <laughs> it's still up there, it's the old logo, um, and, uh, and check it out and star it and contribute and, and keep it moving forward because I think there is a need for uh, a general purpose microservices application that everyone can use and learn from. And um, I think that's it. Yep. So thank you very much. Contact me at details below if you want to talk or come and see me now. Thank you. So thank you, Phil. Okay, no problem. We still have time for a few questions if there are anyone in the audience. Yep. Um, do you have the source code for the example, like for the individual services, not yeah. the deployment, but the, because it's not in that repo, I guess. Yeah, uh, it? yeah. Well, it's not exactly in that repo. It's in okay. um, it's in the the associated repos. Let me show you. So, um, so microservices demo is all, also an organization, and in that organization is all of the code for all of the individual services, so you can check them out there. And we did that. This is actually this is a cool discussion in itself. We split them out um, purely because we wanted to release them um, independently of each other, because we were defined as a bug in one of the services, and we needed to release that. And we're using GitHub releases to kind of manage the CI, CD stuff. So we split them out into separate repositories so that we could release them um, into, uh, into the wild at different times. And uh, it's a good simulation of sort of real life teams in the wild as well. Uh, we we kind of made it intentionally polyglot. So there's, there's Go services, there's Java services, uh, there's, there's, there's Node.js stuff as well. So yeah, that's why we did it. Okay, yeah. any more questions? No? Okay, well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.